Well, why don't you take your Bibles with me and uh, open to the book of, of Matthew. Uh, the book of Matthew, we're back in uh, chapter 13 as we uh, continue our study through the, uh, through the parables, the parables of our, our Lord. And uh, this week I'm excited to, to jump back into the, uh, to the parables uh, uh, this week. And there's so much uh, that's contained in the parables and uh, definitely much more than I'll have the, the opportunity to cover today. Uh, but I pray that I'll be able to communicate the, the truth of this passage effectively and uh, give you a sense of the, the solemn weight of this parable in particular. Uh, really, all the parables are weighty, but this parable in particular, and uh, as well as the glorious hope um, and wonder of the, the passage as well. And with everything that's contained in Scripture, you, you sometimes wonder, why would people want to do anything else when they get up behind a pulpit other than preach the Word? I mean, there's so much that's contained in the Scriptures themselves. Why would you want to go outside of, uh, of the Scriptures uh, in order to give your own ideas and, and opinions on, on things? So uh, we're going to turn our attention to the, uh, the inspired Word of God this morning, uh, Matthew chapter 13, and uh, we'll start at verse uh, 24 and read down to verse 30. It says, Jesus presented another parable to them saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came to him and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us to then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Uh, let's, let's say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you, Lord, uh, once again this morning, as we always do, uh, recognizing, uh, Lord, that it's you who gives us understanding. And, uh, Father, this morning we pray that you would give us understanding of your word. Uh, Father, that you would uh, use me as a weak instrument, Lord, to be a blessing to your people, Lord, and to give a sense of uh, uh, just uh, what we find here. Uh, Father, the, the rich and deep truth uh, that we find here, the glorious truth uh, that we find here, uh, but also a solemn warning, uh, Father, that we find here as well. Uh, so, Father, we uh, I pray that you'd uh, give us your help, Father. In Jesus' name we praise you and give you thanks. Amen. A number of years ago, I was on a, a, a local uh, short-term missions trip to, to New Orleans uh, for some uh, relief work after uh, uh, the Katrina disaster, the hurricane, and I had uh, the opportunity to witness to, to one of the directors of a local city mission uh, who was not a believer, <laughs> a director, one of the directors of a local city mission who was not a believer. And I remember the conversation, not only because there's a, a missions director who doesn't know the Lord, who's running you know, a ministry who doesn't know the Lord, but also because he asked me a question uh, that I don't remember being asked before that time, and this was his question. He said this, he says, if Jesus is the Savior, then why isn't the world saved yet? If Jesus is the Savior, then why isn't the world saved yet? And it's an interesting question because as, as Christians, we believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, right? He's the King, he's the Messiah, he's the Redeemer, he's the Conqueror, he's the Lord of all, and he already came... But when we look around at the world that we live in, uh, there's still disease and death and devastation, like what we saw in the recent hurricanes and earthquakes. Then on top of that, we have mass shootings and terrorist killings and the threat of war every time you turn on the news, there's another threat of something happening. So if Jesus is who he says he is, and Jesus has already come, then why isn't the world saved yet? And that's not a, not a new question. It's an old question. And our Lord knew that this was the kind of question his disciples had even during his earthly ministry. The, the Jewish expectation was that Jesus would arrive as the conquering king and immediately set up shop. One, one commentator puts it this way. He says, according to popular Jewish conception, the Messiah would usher in the kingdom of God, which would establish righteousness and destroy wickedness. Evil and the enemies of Israel would be destroyed. Justice and peace would prevail. Nobody expected that there would be any kind of delay or interruption after the coming of the king. Nobody expected that. The earliest prophecy that we have about Jesus Christ is uh, found back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where it was promised that Jesus would come and crush the head of the serpent. He's the conqueror. That was the expectation. He's coming to conquer. Whoever this one is who's to come, he's coming to conquer. Genesis also ends with a prophecy of a, of a ruler who would come from Judah and bring peace. 
Back in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 49, Genesis chapter 49 in, in verse 10, it actually uh, talks about this. It says that the, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of all peoples. Later on in... Um, we learn about who this ruler is, this ruler who was to come, who would bring peace. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12, it says, when your days are complete and you lie down with your father, speaking about David, he says, I will rise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. They're looking for this one who's coming to establish the kingdom. And what does this kingdom look like? Jeremiah chapter 33, listen to this. Jeremiah 33, 15 to 16. It says, in those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David, so this is the son of David here, to spring forth and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. They're looking for somebody who's going to come in and establish righteousness. In Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on the colt, the foal of a donkey. It says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off, and he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the expectation. And it didn't change during the time of Christ. John the Baptist, if you remember John the Baptist, when he announced the arrival of the king, he declared in, uh, in Matthew chapter 3, in verse 10, he says that the ax is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The expectation was that there was one who was to come who would uproot the evil, who would destroy unrighteousness, and inaugurate this kingdom of righteousness across the entire earth. That was the expectation. So when uh, James and John witnessed the rejection of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 9, verse 54, if you remember that, uh, the disciples, James and John, when they saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? I mean, like, like, let's get this kingdom thing moving. I mean, that's what you came for, right? To destroy unrighteousness, to establish uh, a righteousness on the earth. And even after the resurrection of Christ, they're asking for the same thing. In Acts chapter 1, chap uh, chapter 1 verse 6, it says, when they came together, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time? that you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? You're the conqueror, you've come. But after 2,000 years of church history, Jesus has come, Jesus is gone, and we sit in a world that's overgrown with evil, corruption, disease, destruction, and death. And the question that the disciples had are maybe the same ones that some of us have today. You know, didn't the master sow good seed in the field? <laughs> and if he did, why does it look the way that it does now? And more than that, why doesn't he come and do something about it? Why doesn't he do something to uproot the wickedness that we see played out before us every, every day? And these are the questions that Jesus answers in the second parable. It has immediate application for the disciples in that day and continues to minister uh, to us today as well. We need the parable of the tares and the, the wheat. This is a, a parable that can be divided up into four sections based on just the natural movement of the narrative. You have the, the owner's allotment. In verse 24, he's sowing the good seed in his field. You have the enemy's attack in verse 25. Uh, you have the servant's alarm in uh, verses uh, 26 to 28. And uh, then you have the owner's answer in verse uh, 29 to, to 30. And, uh, and then after that, you actually have the explanation of the, the parable, the application of it uh, given in verses uh, 36 to, to 43. And we'll take a look at that as well. But let's take another look at the story. Look at verse 24. It says, Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. And uh, the stories that, that Jesus gave, like I mentioned before, were brilliant because they're so simple. But if you didn't have the spirit of God enlightening your eyes, giving you understanding, you would miss everything that Jesus was saying. Amen. So, so simple. But if you didn't have your spiritual eyes opened up, you'd miss everything. And, and again, the, the, the story that he gives would have been totally familiar, totally familiar. And if these people understood anything, it would have been farming, right? I mean, that's what they understood. Their life was connected to the land. Much of their life revolved around farming seasons. And here we have the simple story of a man who sowed good seed into his field. The good seed, the good seed would have been unmixed seed, seed that wasn't contaminated by weeds. It was pure seed. It would have been examined before he used it in the field. That's how he could call it good. And the other thing that we observed is that it's his field. He's sowing good seed in his field. It wasn't a field that he rented. It wasn't a field that he borrowed. 
This is his own field. He's planning on it. And later on, we find out that he had servants, which lets us know that this was a man of significant wealth and prominence and uh, just the kind of person that other people would envy. And uh, this man had enemies. Look at verse 25. It says, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. The men who, uh, who slept, they're not sleeping because they're lazy. <laughs> they're sleeping because they're tired. It was just natural to, to sleep at night, right? Amen. Sleeping doesn't imply that the servants were neglectful, that the enemy was stealthy and malicious. That's, that's the point, that he came in under the cover of darkness while people were sleeping so he could sow these, these tares in among the, the wheat. The, the servants are never rebuked for sleeping, which suggests that the enemy came in at a time that they were supposed to be sleeping, you know, probably at nighttime, and the enemy came out and did his work. And it's important for us to understand that the kind of action that this enemy is engaged in, it's not like some kind of teenage prank, you know? It's it's not like, you know, throwing eggs on somebody's car or, you know, throwing toilet paper over somebody's house. That's not the kind of of prank that we have going on here. This This is not just a minor inconvenience. This would have been like, more like sending a virus through somebody's company to delete all of their files. That's the kind of work that this enemy is doing at night. This is malicious. It was meant to destroy everything that this owner worked for. And from what we can tell by the description, uh, these tares uh, are actually known as this uh, kind of, of, of weed known as the bearded darnel. The bearded darnel. It was a poisonous ryegrass that was very common in the east and looked completely like wheat until it matured. So here this enemy comes in and sows this poisonous weed among the, the wheat. It was a degenerate wheat. It wasn't if it wasn't separated from the wheat, it would make it completely useless, completely useless, because it had the, the real possibility of, of making people sick. They couldn't eat it. They couldn't sell it. I mean, there's nothing you can do with it once it's mixed in with this poisonous, poisonous uh, weed here. And there's the real potential of totally wiping out the entire crop. Amen. Not only would the, the, the weeds rob the true wheat of their nutrients, but the darnel got mixed in and you couldn't use it for anything. Totally wasted. And the threat of an enemy doing this was so common Uh, that you actually had a Roman law that was made against this. There was a Roman law against sowing tares among a a neighbor's field that was punishable by Roman law. So this was a common common thing that that happened during this day, which is why the servants are alarmed here. Like, like, what's going on? This is is a crime that this person has committed. Look at verse uh, 26 and uh, uh, 28. 26 through 28. Listen to what it says here. It says, but when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? Do you want us to go and gather them up? And here, here the, the servants, they, they ring out the alarm for the master. It became clear what happened after the, uh, after the, 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 the seed matured. According to one resource, uh, wheat in Israel was planted uh, in the fall and harvested in the spring about six to eight months' time. Uh, So it would have been months before the the servants even realized what was really going on. Months, these these weeds, these tares are growing in, sinking in their roots, growing up next to the wheat. Months before anybody even knows what's happening. And the slaves return to to sound the alarm to the master. Didn't you sow good seed? I thought the seed was examined. Where where did these tares come from? And I I find it interesting that that even here the, the owner is still in full control. He already knew that an enemy was at work. Didn't have to wonder about it. He says, I know what happened. An enemy's done this. An enemy's done this. He knew what kind of field he had. He knew what kind of seed he planted. The only explanation for these tares is that an enemy was at work. And the slaves were eager to get right to work and repair the damage. But in this case, the cure would have been worse than the disease. Trying to gather the weeds ahead of time would have done more damage to the wheat than leaving it alone. And not only would it damage the wheat by sending a crew out to walk in the middle of it, would it trampled on you know, some of the wheat that was growing. So the, so the best solution is what the owner comes up with in verses 29 to 30. Look what he says. He says, no, don't don't gather it up. For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. So the best way to protect the wheat was to leave the weeds. Best way to protect the wheat was to leave the weeds. The farmer trusted that his wheat that he planted would overcome and overpower the weeds. This was a wheat that would preserve, would be, be, be preserved, would persevere. But while the wheat was still growing, it wasn't the time to separate the field. It was the time to, to separate the field during the harvest, not during the time while it's still growing. So that's when all the tares could be gathered together and removed from the earth and the wheat could safely be collected into the barn. And, and all the enemy did 
was really creating more fuel for the fire because he says, at the end, in the harvest, I'll gather up all those weeds. I'll gather up all the weeds. So, so what you really find out here is that the, the owner of the field is victorious, the enemy lost, the weed is saved, and that's the story. That's a simple story, right? Simple story. And it would have remained nothing more than a simple story if God didn't give his disciples ears to hear because there's something else that's at work here. And just like uh, the disciples came earlier to Jesus to, to understand the parable of the sower, here you have the disciples coming back to Jesus again to understand the, the parable of the weeds. Look down at verse 36. Verse 36. Look what he says here. It says, then he left the crowds and went into the house. So this is a private meeting. And his disciples came to, to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. Explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. And I, I love what uh, D.A. Carson says about this. He says, the disciples are not distinguished from the crowds by their instant and intuitive understanding, but by their persistence in seeking explanation. And that should be encouraging for us, because sometimes when you read the Bible, it's like, I don't, I don't understand everything that I read immediately, right? But the disciples aren't known just because they immediately get everything, but in their persistence in coming to the master. That's, that marks out a disciple, right? He persistently comes to the master. What sets them apart from the crowd is that they seek Jesus, not their immediate understanding. And what a gift it is to be able to come directly to, to Jesus, the author of all wisdom and understanding, uh, to get from him uh, the, the proper meaning of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 124, it says the power, that Jesus is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So we come to the power of God and the wisdom of God when we come to Jesus Christ. And every one of us has the same privilege of coming to Jesus, right? In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 7, uh, the apostle Paul tells Timothy, he says, consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. The Lord gives us understanding, which recognizes that it takes mental energy. You know, consider what I say. You have to ponder over it, think over it. But it's the Lord who grants understanding. And it's the same thing that's, that's true of us as well. In uh, Psalm 119, in verse 25, uh, 125, it says, I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. We're servants of, of God. We come to him uh, for understanding. And it's just a, an immense privilege to be able to come to the Lord. And here you have the disciples coming to the Lord to understand the parable. They knew, they knew something about the tares was significant. They call it the parable of the tares. Explain to us the parable of the tares. And this is a good place to, to make a comment about interpreting parables really quick. In most cases, the parables only have one major point, all right? So as you're reading through, through parables, in most cases, there's only one major point. It's unwise to try to apply meaning to every element uh, within a, a parable. People have uh, gotten in all kinds of trouble, you know, trying to say, well, this means this and this means that. Uh, one, one good example is the, the parable of the, the Good Samaritan. I've heard all kinds of explanations for what the, the Good Samaritan uh, means. Listen to, listen to this. One interpretation of the Good Samaritan says this. The man who was beaten as a sinner... The priest who stands is the law. The Levite is the sacrifices. Jesus is the Samaritan who pays the bill. The inn is the church. The believers are the ones who, who care uh, for, the, for the man. The two silver coins are baptism and the Lord's Supper. <laughs> the two coins that, that he gave to the, to the innkeeper. And the innkeeper is the apostle Paul. I mean, th these are kinds of explanations that you have when, when people just allow their imaginations to, to run wild. Well, this must mean this and this must mean... That's not how you, how you interpret a, a parable. It's creative, <laughs> but it's nothing in the context would, would, would lead us to that. And even here where uh, many of the details have a meaning, we don't have a meaning for every element. And Jesus is the one that explains the, the meaning, right? So you have to understand it within its own context. Every element doesn't have a meaning, and it's the context that helps us understand what it means. And here you have something that was explaining a situation that was actually going on. The disciples at this time are frustrated. The disciples are frustrated. Here, here they are as the, the message is going out. You know, the good news is going out. You know, Jesus is here. He's the conqueror. He's the king. Why aren't things changing? Lord, aren't you going to do something? Are you going to uproot these people or not? I mean, the, the world is going crazy. Lord, what are you doing? Aren't you the owner? Aren't you the one who owns the field? What's going on, Lord? That's the kind of questions that they would, would have. And the Lord is helping them to answer those kinds of, of questions. And this help us, helps us to put the pieces together here. Look at verse uh, 24. 24 again. It says, Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Let's look down at verses uh, 37 to 39 just to get the explanation. Look at what he says. He says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. 
And the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. Reapers are the angels. So here he talks about the the owner. The owner is me. (laughs) I'm the owner. The world is my field. Which, which is, which is a, a wonderful place. If you're looking for a place to, to, to prove that Jesus is God, this is a great place to do it. Why? Because Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, or all that it contains, the world and all those who dwell in it. It says the earth is the Lord's. Jesus says, you know what? The earth is mine. <laughs> so if the, the earth is the Lord's and the earth belongs to Jesus, then who is Jesus? Jesus is the Lord. He's the owner of the entire world. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, is the owner of the entire earth. If the earth is the Lord's and it belongs to Jesus, Jesus is the Lord. And his kingdom encompasses the whole globe. Wherever you might live, you're on property that belongs to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ owns every square inch of this planet. The field belongs to him. And his sowing is the citizens of the kingdom. In every place, Jesus is spreading those who believe and trust in him. And, and that's what the ministry of the word was accomplishing. As the, the word was going out, we learned about the parable of the sower. Jesus is spreading the, the, the word of God. His citizens are, are, are spreading the word of God. And as that word goes out, people are coming to Jesus Christ and his kingdom citizens are being born and brought about in every place in this world. This is what the word of the gospel does. Every heart that's transformed becomes a, a, a seed that's planted in the earth, a seed that's planted for the kingdom. But the enemy has seed too. The enemy has seed too. Look, look back at verse 25. Look back at verse 25. It says, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. Amen. You only have two options. Yes, sir. Only two options. There's only, there's, there's only two types of seed that you might be today. That's exactly right. Either you belong to yes, Jesus sir. Christ, you've been sown by Jesus Christ, or you belong to Satan. Yes. There, there's, there's no spiritual orphans. <laughs> Everybody has a father. Everybody has a daddy. Either you belong to Jesus or you belong to Satan. And that's what he says here, that, that none of us are orphans. We all belong to one person or the other. And Satan has seed. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, the one who practiced sin is of the devil. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 says that before salvation, we used to walk according to the, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Sons of disobedience. John 8, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and says, you are of your father, the devil. And in uh, 1 John 5, 19, it says, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And just like Jesus sows his seed across the world, Satan is busy sowing his seed across the world. And his children are poisonous plants that oppose the work of God. That's why they were planted. That's why the enemy sowed the seed was to oppose the work of Jesus. So here you have these, 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 these citizens, these children of Satan, who are set in motion to oppose Jesus' work. This is what we're, we're talking about here. They're used by the enemy to oppose Jesus' work. They might not all know that they're being used. They might not come out and say, I'm being used by Satan to try to oppose the work of God. But that's, in fact, what they're doing. If they belong to Satan, they're in opposition to Jesus Christ. Actually, the Bible calls them enemies of God. But Satan is powerless. Think, think about this. He's powerless to stop the progress of the sons of the kingdom. And the seed's already sown, right? The wheat is already on, on the way. And in, in, in the case of the unbeliever, we saw last time that, you know, Satan tries to snatch the word from the heart. You know, he, he tries to, to turn the shallow, you know, Christians away by persecution, choke the word of God, you know, by the cares of this world. But if, if you're already wheat, there's nothing he can do about it. So what does he do? He, 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 he can't pick up all the wheat. So what he does is he sows the tares, <laughs> Because he can't, he can't destroy the wheat. There's nothing he can do ultimately to stop the sons of the kingdom. So in this case, Satan figures if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> you can't beat them, join them. I can't, I can't pull up all the wheat, so I'm going to sow the tares among the wheat. Can't beat them, join them. And they can almost look alike. They grow up together. They blend in. They're placed side by side. Sometimes they're even religious. Second yeah. Corinthians chapter 11, fifth, uh, starting in verse 13 says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. In uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, it says, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. They, 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 They grow up right next to the wheat. They look like the wheat, you know, they talk like the wheat, 
But the difference is, is that they're not wheat, right? And what's, what's the difference between wheat and what's not wheat? The difference is tares have no fruit. That's the difference between tares and wheat. Tares have no fruit. And all throughout scripture, the fruitless plant is the candidate for being cut up, plucked up, burned in the fire. It's the fruitless plant. Matthew chapter 3, verse 10. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Matthew 7, 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Matthew 13, verse 40. So tares, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The fruit of repentance and a changed life is the evidence that we believe. It's the evidence. You know, James chapter 18 says, I will show you my faith by my works. That's the fruit. There, there has to be a changed life. There's got to be some evidence of repentance, righteousness, a changed life. No fruit, no evidence that you're part of the kingdom of God. No fruit, no evidence. Yes, sir. Servant's alarm. Look at uh, verses 26 to 28 one more time. 26 to 28. It says, when the wheat sprouted, bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, do you, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us to go then and gather them up? But he said, No. For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Like I said, when it became obvious, became obvious that the, there's destructive and poisonous plants that threaten the wheat, the question becomes like, what, what's the Lord going to do about this? Is he going to pick this up? Like I said, his kingdom is, is the entire globe. And uh, the question is, isn't God going to do something? Lord, why don't you do something? Why does the world look like it does after 2,000 years of church history? I know I've asked that question about false, te- like, Lord, why do you allow these false teachers to continue to have television shows and radio programs? Like, why? Why, Lord? Why don't you root them up? Why does it seem like the world has the upper hand on the Christian? Why aren't we pulling out the weeds and exercising our dominion authority over the field? Where, where's the Christian society being built, right? That's the same anxious spirit that James and John had in Luke chapter 9 when they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down and burn them up? But it's not our position to weed God's field. That's not our job. And history has taught us enough through crusades and inquisitions and all the rest of it that we don't, just, we don't do a good job at trying to weed God's field for them, right? Last week we, we celebrated the, the Reformation, and it, and it should be celebrated the recovery of the, the gospel, of grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. Those are things we celebrate, right? The gospel. We, we celebrate the gospel. And we should rejoice in that. But sadly, there were some things that were connected to the Reformation that we should grieve over. In Switzerland and southern Germany, there were uh, religious groups that embraced much of the theology of the Reformation, but they also believed that the Reformation stopped short of a complete return to the apostles' teaching. Uh, these groups were considered radical because they taught things like this that it was necessary to repent and have personal faith in Christ before you were baptized. So they would rebaptize people even after they were baptized as, as infants. They were called the Anabaptists. They also refused to, to baptize their infants, was, which was at that time considered a form of child abuse. You don't baptize your, your infant? You know, what, you're trying to send your kids to hell is what they were, were thinking. It's considered child abuse. They were viewed as dangerous rebels, heretical. In many areas, the church was uh, connected to the state so disobedience to the church was also considered disobedience to the state because they're, they're connected, right? You disobey one, you're disobeying the other. And these Anabaptists, many of them were hunted down by the thousands and executed. All of these groups, like I said, they, they weren't the, the same. You know, there were various groups. All of them didn't believe the same thing. But I can let you know that, that many of these were our brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And somebody thought they were doing God a favor by trying to uproot the weeds, <laughs> We're going to go out and uproot the weeds. And while they're trying to uproot the weeds, what are they also uprooting? They're uprooting the wheat, pulling the the, the weed out. Somebody thought they could clear God's field for them. Uh, One commentator said this. He says, clearly any idea of judging or any thought that we will obliterate evil are set aside by this parable. We cannot be tolerant of evil, but the destruction of all evil is not our task. We must stop being evil. We must stop evil from destroying, but how can we stop evil without becoming evil in the process? If you're on some kind of crusade to try to eradicate all evil from the world, how do you avoid becoming evil yourself? You're you're not the judge. You are not the judge. So so here you have, you know, Christians in in times past, you know, or people who call themselves Christians in times past, who thought they were doing God a favor. I'm going to uproot the weeds for you, Lord. 
We're going to establish some kind of Christian society. And in the process, they're killing off Christians as well. This is, and this is a totally different question than uh, what we should do in the church, okay? And I just want to make sure that's clear because some people would say that, well, this is teaching that we should allow the tares and the, the wheat to grow up together in the church and make no distinction within the church. You know, you shouldn't have church discipline because how do you know if you discipline a member, you know, that there might actually be wheat? You know, you, you don't know that. So people say, oh, we shouldn't even do that within the church. Uh, it was St. Augustine uh, who went so far as to say that a mixture of good and evil in the church is a necessary sign of the church. And I'd say that he was absolutely wrong <laughs> because you have other scriptures that talk about what we do within the church. And, and remember what, what Jesus says, the world is the field. It's not the, the church is the field, it's the world is the field. So this isn't talking about you know, Christians trying to clean up the church, it's talking about tr Christians trying to clean up the world. <laughs> That's not our job. Those who are outside, the Bible says, I will judge. You worry about what's on the inside. That's, that's what the, the scripture says. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 13, it says, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. That's the, the responsibility of the church. Matthew chapter 18, it talks about you know, church discipline, which we're, we have the responsibility of doing to try to keep a purified church. So Matthew 13 isn't talking about removing unrepentant members from the church, but removing unbelievers from the world, okay? That's, that's the context here. And God has given the, the church responsibility, uh, but God has also reserved the right to judge the world, which brings us back to our final point, and it really helps us un understand and answer the question that we started with. If, if Jesus is the Savior, the King, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Conqueror, the Lord of all, why isn't the world saved yet? And the answer to that is uh, given in the text, the world isn't saved yet because Jesus isn't ready to judge yet. <laughs> The world isn't saved yet because Jesus isn't ready to, to judge yet. Look at the, 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 the answer of the, the owner again in verse, verse 30. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. And according to verse 39, the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Before the wheat is harvested, all the weeds are gathered together, burned with fire, which is the judgment of unbelievers. Uh, flip over to Matthew 24 real quick. Matthew 24. I used to think Matthew 24 was uh, talking about the, the rapture of the church. But if it was, it would be giving us the wrong picture. <laughs> Look at uh, Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse, verse 37. Matthew 24, look at verse 37. It says, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect, right? When you do not think he will. I used to think this passage was talking about the rapture, but like I said, it would be giving us the wrong picture because uh, being taken in this context isn't a good thing. Those who were taken by the flood it wasn't a good thing, right? Having your house broken into isn't a good thing, <laughs> right? It's not talking about being taken in, in comfort and in joy. It's being taken in judgment. That's what it's talking about here. Being taken away in judgment. Back into Matthew, uh, Matthew 13. Back in Matthew 13, look at, uh, at verse 41. Because there's, there's coming a day when the angels will gather out of this world those who do not belong to Jesus Christ. Every poisonous weed, every person in opposition to Jesus Christ, every person in opposition to the rule of God will be taken. Look at verses 41 and 42 again. It says, the son of man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right now, the world is filled with people who oppose the kingdom of God. And they're described as stumbling blocks, as those who practice lawlessness. They stand in your way when you're trying to do the right thing. The word for, for stumbling block is the, the Greek word scandalon. It's a, a Greek word that's used for, for an animal trap or, or a snare. 
And doesn't that describe how you feel as a Christian sometimes? You know, you're trying to walk free in the holiness of God and the world around you constantly tries to rope you down, hold you down, pull you back. System of the world isn't set up for the success of the Christian, if you, if you didn't know that already, all right? It's not set up for your success. The world is at war with righteousness. And the more holy we try to live is the greater resistance that there's going to be. And the sons of the evil one are a snare to oppose the Christian. And as much as we hear about tolerance and acceptance and diversity and equality, there is no tolerance for the kingdom of God. <laughs> there is no acceptance for the kingdom of God. And as kind and as loving and as gracious as you might want to be and, you, and say as, as sweetly as you can, Jesus is king. The world can't tolerate it. <laughs> it doesn't matter how kind you try to be. It's not welcome. But not only do they oppose the way that we live by their actions, they also oppose God's law by their actions. It says they're, they're lawless. The sons of this kingdom the kingdom of this world, the sons of Satan, they throw off the restraint of God's law in their life. They're called lawless. So on the one hand, they try to prevent you from doing the right thing. And on the other hand, they attempt to remove any kind of restrictions or restraints so they can have all the personal freedom that I want. I don't want God's law over me. And one day, their freedom will be completely removed as they're gathered together, bundled up in a heap, tossed into the fire, which is a common biblical picture of, of judgment. It's not... The, it's, the, it's the fire of a furnace, <laughs> fire of a furnace it's called. He mentions it again just a few verses later in verses uh, 49 to, to 50. This, this, isn't, this isn't like, you know, just kind of hidden truth that you have to kind of, you know, uh, break out your magnifying glass to try to find. This is just all over the place. Look at 49 and, and 50. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Same thing described over in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of, of fire. It's a place of eternal conscious torment where you never go out of existence. This is not an annihilation. It's a place where you weep and grind and chatter your teeth for all of eternity. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mentioned five times in the book of Matthew alone, that phrase, weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a fearful thing, fearful thought. But God doesn't allow us to escape it if we take the scriptures seriously. So why isn't the world saved yet? Because Christ is not ready to judge the world yet. <laughs> Look over in uh, 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter, Peter reminds us that things were bad during the days of Noah. People began to, to mock the judgment of God. Oh, you're saying that judgment's going to come. Everything's been just the way it's always been. Nothing's changing. Nothing's going to change. Look at 2 Peter, Peter chapter 3. Verse 3, it says, Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, they, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And then over in verse 7, But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved. Being reserved, there's a date, there's a reservation. Being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to, but for all to come to repentance. Not wishing for any to perish. God isn't slow. <laughs> God isn't slow. God is patient. Why, why isn't the world judged yet? Why, why aren't things fixed yet? Because God is patient. He's patient. He's delayed his judgment to call men and women to repentance. That's the purpose of his delay. It's not because he doesn't know what's going on. It's not because he couldn't do anything to fix it. He's being patient and allowing people an opportunity to repent, calling people to repentance. And if you're here today and you're wheat, you need to know that you weren't always wheat. <laughs> you weren't always wheat. Your nature was changed over in uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I love this. Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse, verse 3. It says, among them we too all formerly lived. Among whom? Among the weeds. <laughs> among the tares. This was us. 
Among them too, among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. We were just like the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by his grace, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. God is patient. And God was patient with you. (laughs) And God allowed your nature to be changed so that he could gather you into his barn. And the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness in Christ Jesus is explained. If you want to flip back one more time to Matthew chapter uh, chapter 13, I want to just uh, explain this this grace that's going to be given to us real quick. This this is glorious. This is glorious. This, this, This is beautiful. Look what it says here, verse 43. It says, then, this is talking about our inheritance. This is what's in the future for those who belong to Jesus Christ. It says, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the picture of the glorification of the children of God. Jesus quotes from uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 in this uh, context. In uh, in Daniel chapter uh, 12, it it speaks of a time in the future where many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake to everlasting life. It's talking about this future resurrection, the glorification, and will enjoy the glory of a body like our Savior. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Because we'll see him just as as he is. It's not something that we think about often, but do you know that your physical body will be transformed into a body that is fit for eternity? Do you know that? Your body will be transformed into a body that will be fit for eternity. Over in, uh, I know I I said that was the last scripture. One more. First first, uh, first Corinthians. First first Corinthians. First Corinthians. Look at uh, chapter 15. This This is beautiful. First Corinthians chapter 15. I love this. Look at, verse, look at verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come? You fool. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's something to pay attention. When God calls you a fool, you know, that's, that's something you need to pay attention to, right? You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain. Anybody remember that word from anywhere else? <laughs> The seed that's been planted in the world, you sow a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something else, but God gives it a body just as he has wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one flesh of men, another of flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun. We're going to shine forth like what? The sun. And another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. We have a spiritual body that, that we're waiting for. Do you understand that? We have a spiritual body that's going to shine in glory. If you think back in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Exodus, think back in Exodus on top of Mount Sinai, who was up there? Moses in the presence of God. When he came back down, what happened? His face shone with the glory of God. In the presence of God, his face shone with the glory of God. Moses didn't even know that his face was shining. People had to cover him up. They ran and hid themselves from Moses. Because in the glory of God, he was being glorified and being transformed. When we see uh, Christ transfigured on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17, he was transfigured before them. This is verse 2. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His garments became as white as light. And there is a glory that awaits every one of us as believers in Jesus Christ, that we will be transformed into a body like our saviors. What you see is not what you get. There is a glorious future awaiting those who are are sons of the kingdom of, of Jesus Christ. So, so 
as we look out into this world as everything is dark and dreary and death and disease and destruction, and we're wondering, Lord, Lord, don't you see what's going on? How long, Lord? Lord, aren't you going to change anything? This is the change that's coming. The change will arrive. There is a glory that awaits each one of us who belongs to Jesus Christ from the least of us to the greatest of us. Everybody is going to be transformed, the promise of his glory. Martin Martin Luther, the the great reformer, and his wife Katie were blessed with six children of their own. He had the unhappy duty of uh, saying goodbye to his daughter, Magdalena, who died when she was only 14 years old. 14 years old. When she was on her deathbed, Luther prayed, Oh God, I love her so, but thy will be done. And he, he, he actually uh, confessed that it's like, you know, Lord, this is something I, I'm struggling. I, I want to rejoice. He believed in the sovereignty of God. He wanted to rejoice, but he says, God, I can't rejoice. As he watches his 14-year-old daughter lying on her deathbed, and Luther prayed, oh, God, I love her so, but thy will be done. Then he turned to his daughter, Magdalene, and he says, my little girl, would you be glad to go to your father in heaven? And she said, yes, father, as God wills. And as Luther held his child in his arms, and she passed on, And as she was laid away, he says, you will rise like and shine like the stars and the sun. You will rise and shine like the stars and the sun. I think he had Matthew 13 in mind. You're going to, you're going to rise and shine like the stars and the sun. And this is the future of all those who belong to to Jesus Christ. Beloved, we are now the children of God. It has not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. There's more to the story, guys right? It's more to the story. Jesus is the owner of the field and he's still in full and total control. He's in control. He's the one who's permitted the righteous and the wicked to coexist together. He's he's allowed that for this time. And even though sometimes we can't tell the difference between the wicked and the righteous, eventually they will be separated. And everything that causes evil and all who do evil will be removed. And the righteous will persevere and will be gathered together into the barn, which is a picture of the kingdom of God. The Lord is not slow. The Lord is patient. The Lord is patient. The Lord's coming is near. The judge is standing at the door. He is the Savior. He is the King. He is the Messiah. He is the Redeemer. He is the Conqueror. He is the Lord of all. He's come before and he will come again. Amen? Amen. just want to read these uh, words just in, in closing. We sang the song earlier, Rejoice the Lord is King. And I I pray that you're rejoicing in God. I pray that you're rejoicing. Listen to these words. Rejoice the Lord is King. Your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks, and sing, and triumph evermore. Our Savior Jesus reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. His kingdom cannot fail. He rules over earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Rejoice in glorious hope. For Christ the judge shall come to gather all his saints to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. I say rejoice, amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, and uh, Father, we uh, thank you. We uh, give you praise and glory and honor for this glorious text. Father, we pray that we would uh, uh, take the warning seriously as well for those who are here who may not be believers, who may not have trusted in Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, I pray that Today would be the day that they wouldn't remain as weeds, that they wouldn't remain in opposition to you, but that today would be the day that they would become wheat. And there's only one way that we can become wheat. It's through trusting in your son, Jesus Christ, the one who came as the perfect lamb of God, the one who was unblemished, unstained by the sin of this world, the one who lived the perfect life in our place and who died as a substitute and took upon himself the wrath of an eternal God upon his own shoulders, upon his own head, so that we might be set free. And Father, for any who believe and trust in Jesus Christ, this glorious future can await them. And so Father, I pray for repentance. I pray for faith. I pray that you would open up blind eyes. I pray that you would give understanding. Lord, even today, for your namesake and for your glory alone, in Jesus' name we praise you and give you thanks. Amen.